project is dealing on the rise and fall of the Celtic Church or the Irish Golden Age. I'll show you some of the resources that we have. Uh, here is one, of course, uh, the facsimile of the uh, Book of Kells. And, uh, and that's uh, important to understand about that. And uh, the whole life of uh, Colin Kell, uh, the things he uh, wrote, started there, you know, began Kells. And then we have the other one then on uh, St. Patrick. The real St. Patrick is another book, of course, to understand uh, what he, uh, all about St. Patrick that we'll be dealing with. And, uh, and then, of course, we have a, the course of Irish history. And, uh, and that's a very, very, very important. Uh, great men, like uh, uh, we have uh, a Cardinal O'Fee, and uh, he, he was very special, uh, particularly uh, for the Irish situation. And so uh, there it is. So uh, continuing then with this uh, topic, the rise and fall of the Celtic Church, we hope you'll be able to, we'll be able to learn something uh, from this uh, and the great men uh, of, uh, from Ireland. So uh, uh, where did the Celts come from? They were originally Celtic, and uh, where did they come from? Well, uh, we would imagine uh, North Turkey or uh, north of uh, Iran, Iraq, around about there. Um, of course, uh, uh, most people came from uh, uh, the Tower of Babel or of the Chaldees. And uh, most people would come there, but they think the Celts would be mainly, uh, you know, uh, north, uh, the Celts would mainly be north Turkey. Uh, of course, they say the spread came, most people spread from Babylon and the Tower of Babel, of course, uh, quite there uh, something. Uh, and uh, uh, the sun and planet, there were sun and planet worshippers. We know that uh, our of the Chaldees, they were all Zoroastrian and they were uh, uh, sun worshippers and they, they, they studied the planets. They were great astrologers and astronomers too as well, you see. But um, uh, because of the things they did and the way they could uh, uh, make uh, Stonehenge and, and uh, 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 New Grange, you know, it was just amazing, you know, the ability they had. Now, our first settler's medicine was, of course, the Sweet Meadow, of course. That would be a great painkiller, aspirin, you know. And uh, their dwellings were, of course, uh, the, um, uh, out in the lakes, you know, they, uh, uh, there you see. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, they dwelt uh, mainly in those places. Uh, and that was quite something, you see, you know, to have the Cranogs, the Cranogs out on, on the lakes. And then, of course, in our own local area, King Malachi, uh, he was reputed to be uh, uh, <clears throat> here at Loch Edel and had his uh, Cranog there and forts and uh, was one of the big uh, men of uh, around about uh, uh, Loch Edel. And what is left? Well, there's the monuments of the past left. Uh, New Grange, of course, and that is quite, quite amazing, you know. And, uh, you know, and of course, there's the uh, amazing the way the sun shone in through that hole at the top, uh, right into, uh, to light up the place where their ancestors were buried. Uh, all to do, you see, with that, with sun worship and with the dead, and of course, uh, but it was quite astronomical for the sun to shine through up the passageway. And so that idea, of course, I'm sure, was brought from Babel. Uh, they were very intelligent, you know, and uh, surprising finds were, have been recently got near uh, Stonehenge. Uh, I know uh, it is quite amazing, anyone who looks into that. And uh, of course, it's overlapping the Stone Age etc., you know, uh, note 6,000 uh, years ago. Uh, Genesis 4.20, and Ada bore Jabel. He was the father of those who dwelt in tents and have livestock. They were farmers then, you see, you know. And uh, in 20, verse 21, his brother's name was Jubal. 
he was the father of all who played the harp. So they were able to make harps and they had to have wire and, uh, to, to do that and uh, flute. And as, and as for Zilla, she also bore treble cane and in, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. Of course, it tells us too, there was gold too as well that they got. Uh, very rich, of course, indeed. Well, where did this, um, this religion was, of course, of the Celtic Church, uh, not the Celtic Church, of course, uh, but the religion of the Celts was uh, Druidism, you know, the Druid priests, the Celtic, and the Celtic expansion there, we see it came from uh, this yellow area, and uh, particularly we're thinking how they got across to Ireland through uh, France, Gaul, and then into to Britain, and then, of course, to Ireland. And they traveled up different ways there, you see, up the sea uh, to those places on to Kerry. So the Christian uh, uh, Celts, they were, they, they were from Asia and, uh, and uh, Minor, uh, Asia Minor, uh, would be South Turkey. Galatia, of course, they often think about them coming from Galatia, the Galatian church there. And uh, they would have brought Christianity to Ireland. And there they are, some of those great men. They men, those were, uh, some of them were great warriors, you know. And, uh, but there were also uh, great Christians once they were uh, converted. So. Uh, Celtic warriors then just showing some of these, of the, uh, they would be mainly pagan, of course. Celtic art is amazing, you know. It's amazing the Celtic art they had, and these men would carry their very expensive art on their, the battlefield, you know, onto the battlefield. They wouldn't mind having a very expensive uh, gold uh, uh, bra bracelet around their neck or whatever. And so, but it tells us there that they sacked Rome in 390 BC. Uh, that was quite uh, the end, uh, getting near the end of Rome. And they founded the kingdom of uh, Galicia, uh, too. That was in uh, South Turkey. Uh, so the Christians in Ireland before Patrick. Were the Christians in Ireland before Patrick? Uh, most people uh, would say there were uh, some Christians in Ireland. Not very organized, but there were some there. And uh, the question then is, where was Patrick from South uh, Dalriada. Dalriada was that part on the west side of uh, Scotland, England, uh, and uh, a, there's the possibility that we think that he came from uh, uh, that area. What was that area? Well, it was, there was a Roman fort at Burdeswald, and his uh, parents may have had some involvement there. Um, uh, his father was a courier, and of course a deacon in the church. <laughs> Uh, he was very involved in that. So uh, Patrick's birth was about 390 AD, 390 AD. So that was quite uh, quite interesting, wasn't it? Um, all right. And Patrick began his six year slavery in Ireland from that area. What happened? Taken captive about the year 406 AD at Vanavem uh, Tabernay. Uh, there's no really uh, recollection, can't really work out the place so very well. He was aged 16, and with thousands more, uh, they were brought to Ireland as slaves. So, and the ships, of course, they came uh, with those raiders. He was sold to a chieftain in the west of Ireland. While uh, minding sheep, there he prayed, repenting of his wasted teenage years. He had fallen away from those things and tried, lost interest, but really now uh, God is working in his life. That is the great. God helped him to return home and said, God said to him, your ship's ready. And he started walking out the 200 miles across to the uh, east side, you know, and uh, there he did find the ship ready. Uh, of course, it was a 200 mile trek from the west. Right. 
He arrived in Britain, but the captain pressed him if he was a Christian, his God should provide food because they were starving. They had no food for uh, some days and uh, God did provide a miracle. There was, of course, a big herd of uh, uh, pigs came across the hill and they were able to kill them and cook them and had enough of food to do the rest of the journey. The family were happy to welcome him home. That was about 412 AD. He was, uh, he uh, came home, you know, that was quite uh, uh, a happy time for them. They didn't want him to go away again. And there he became a serious Christian worker. He came involved in the church and the British church, and uh, which was a Celtic church, of course, there, you know, and uh, a very, very keen uh, and all that. Uh, right. So God had a plan for his life. That was the great thing. He had a great plan for his life. Uh, but uh, uh, Victoricus uh, had a handful of letters that he showed uh, in a dream, vision or dream to Patrick as a young boy, as the young fellow. And uh, he, uh, of course, the vice that go, uh, came was the vice of the Irish. He, he could recognize them to some extent. Come, holy youth, and walk among us. That was the call. It was like the Macedonian call that another man, St. Paul, got uh, in, uh, uh, that he got in, uh, uh, in Asia, where he was directed to go to, to, into Europe, to bring the gospel there. So Patrick identified it as people from the wood of Fokalot near Killala County Mayo. That was in the west of Ireland, of course. And he identified it there and felt that God was calling him then back to Ireland to work amongst them. Much to the, uh, oh, the family were not too happy. Was Patrick self-taught? Well, yes, he appeared to be, would have been self-taught. There's no indication he wouldn't have uh, went to Rome because it was in not in a very good state. And uh, Gaul, it doesn't seem he, in his own writings, he has not talked about being visiting Gaul. So Rome was hacked on uh, uh, the 24th of August, 1410 AD. Uh, for, sorry, not 14, four, 410 AD. Uh, the city was attacked by the Visigoths, led by King Alaric. And I understand from the reading that King Alaric was a Christian. Uh, and uh, but uh, he uh, they felt they should do this, you know. So the final end then of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire wasn't very good, you know, and it was the final end of the Roman Empire. It uh, that was around 455 A.D. Right? 455 A.D. Rome would not be a safe place, of course, then for a young fella to go to at that time. And uh, uh, it had to, took a little time settling. Um, it settled down and it was a very peaceful, more a peaceful time in Ireland then, you see, because there wasn't the problems in England. They, they, the soldiers, the Roman, the um, Roman soldiers were all going, leaving England and uh, going away and they were leaving, uh, I, uh, well, they didn't come to Ireland, but it was quite a safe place, you see, you know, uh, in, in Ireland and safe for to get on with the work. Uh, Patrick's Bible, his Bible was in the old Latin before Jerome's version of Polish Latin. That's why we see in his writings that he didn't have very good, it wasn't polished Latin. It wasn't very good Latin, it was poor Latin. And uh, uh, of course he'd, he would have understood the Irish language, old Gaelic more so. But uh, the official language of course would be Latin. But he was called to evangelize the Irish. That's what he felt, that's what he, he uh, set his heart on, mind on, and, uh, but there was family obstacles. They weren't too happy, you see, about it all, uh, leaving them, you know, letting them go. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, he felt uh, he should go. And uh, he returned to Ireland in uh, 435 AD. Right. 
appointed bishop there, amazing, and of course thousands were converted and baptized and uh, organized churches, organized the monastic settlements, you know, uh, that was what was uh, uh, quite a lot uh, in Ireland, there was churches and monastic settlements, on the monastic settlement they would have a church. But he suffered persecution, you know, and uh, did get put in prison, held, you know, in chains, uh, sadly, by a, d a different uh, people. And uh, he mentions a man, he wrote a letter to Karathikos, who was not very good to Christians, and did uh, cause uh, the Christians a lot of problems. But Ireland now became uh, its golden age. It was the great rise of the Celtic Church, and the great rise of, of uh, 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 things in Ireland. Uh, a great uh, interest after uh, learning the Bible and the Psalms and all that, you know. And where the snakes, the Druid priests, you know. There was no snakes in Ireland, you know, at that time. They talk about snakes in Ireland, but uh, we feel it's symbolic of the Dru Druid priests. The Druid priests were uh, <laughs> unusual boys, weren't they? They were high rank, you know, they were from high rank, really. Highly intelligent, you know. Uh, they'd cast spells on people uh, and use healings as well. They'd try that, but they're very successful, but I'm sure they had some success. And uh, they were feared because they could easily uh, take their, their best animal bull or they could take their their daughter, their beautiful daughter, as well. There's some stories about that too, you know, about human sacrifices, you know. And that was very sad, you know, as well. Uh, the final end, of course, uh, for them then, that was the finish of the Celts, of the, uh, sorry, Druids, and the Druid priests and their whole practice of religion. Uh, but of course, it may be still held in some way, you know. So why monastic settlements? Here is the monastic settlement, and uh, there you see they're all centered around, and there were co communities, you see, where a group of uh, workers would be together there, but these people, they weren't like monasteries. They didn't hold into this, well, there wasn't much to hold them in, was there? No big walls or anything like that then. It was all uh, wood or timber, and they would, um, there would, there would be, it would be a safe, quite a safe place for them, reasonably safe. And uh, they would, um, uh, you know, uh, teach the people. And uh, uh, the leader of the group would be uh, an abbot. And uh, they, uh, they're not hermits, you know. And of course, they would have uh, a, a, all these uh, abbots who would be married have a, uh, a wife and a family and sometimes the son of course was uh, would uh, go on uh, would be the next abbot uh, which uh, might be a problem of the Celtic church the son may not be of the caliber of the father but there were some of these men in the early days were amazing men there were great leaders and great men and they were not hermits you know they didn't just hive away and 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 try to do uh, uh, you know, these things but they really uh, uh, they were um, very keen to to read the word of God and they were very keen to learn and to know that they were, could be saved by the real power and the, the power of God in their lives. So they taught the Bible to the people and they believed that it were saved by grace through faith. Not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so they sang the Psalms, they, they loved the Psalms, uh, you know, as we'll mention maybe a bit about that after. They, they really uh, uh, dwelt on that so much. And they were copyists. They copied the Psalms, you know. We remember two of those who copied them. And that was starting with these uh, monastics. And then, of course, some of these things were stolen and, and taken uh, by the raiders, you know. Uh, I suppose they would sell them for money. And they kill or kill. That's the, name, that's the word for church. And that is the little church meeting that I always have in the middle or one area of the, uh, the community, you know. Right. And people could come there, but they also went out with the gospel to the different areas as well. 
and that is great. Right. And so uh, there they would travel, you know, uh, you know, for the different places. And uh, they had the huts, beehive huts, and the uh, monastery there at Skellig Michael. Out there was a wild, rough spot there for them to be. But uh, how would they love to be, uh, you know, in those places? Uh, wouldn't be very warm, would it now? And uh, quite rough, uh, and not nice beds to go in. And of course, the organi organizing many monastic communities. That was the great job of Patrick all over Ireland in different parts, especially uh, the West, uh, different parts of um, the Northern part uh, from uh, the line of uh, uh, Wicklow, right up, uh, even farther south than Wicklow, across to Galway, right up then to the north. And uh, the long travels on Shanksmere, you know Shanksmere. There was no uh, planes or trains or any way of horses or that. There's no word of him riding a horse or a donkey or anything like that. Uh, he must have traveled on his shanks. And uh, there is uh, one of the churches that there's a uh, tall down Patrick County Down that was reconstructed on the site of uh, the original soul. They called it Saul. Uh, reconstructed uh, Celtic church. St. Patrick too, the county down, is reputed the grave of St. Patrick. Other saints too were, were brought there, like uh, Common Kill and, and others. So the great leaders to take up the baton. After Patrick, you see, they needed the great leaders. There were some mighty men, you know, too, as well. Very, very uh, well prepared. And there was uh, Armagh, Cormac, who was the Bishop Abbot of uh, Armagh. And uh, Aran Islands, the Abbots trained many there. Oh, I can't go into all this details they did, but you can read more about these places, you know. In Clonard trained 12 Apostles of Ireland. They were, they were very busy there. Uh, there were some great men from Clonard. And Bangor, Comgal. He started uh, Bangor. And uh, there was, oh, the men that came from there was quite amazing. There were a great Bible teaching and, and uh, all that, you see. Moville started by Finian. Right. Glendalough, Kevin, and Tume, Garlat, and Cork, Finbar. So we have to fly on, you know, there. And the, there were three female abbesses at that time, too, as well. And uh, at Kildare, male and female leadership shared by an abbot. And St. Bridget's was the abbess. Outstanding abbots, then. So at Gartan, uh, in County Donegal, eh, we have Columkill. He's known uh, across in Scotland as St. Columba. And uh, of course, here is the birthplace. He was born 521 to 597. So he had a, a quite a, a reasonable life, hard working. He was the son of Philem and uh, Etne uh, of the, the Royal House of Arlick and, and Leinster. And uh, there was, of, of course, royal descent. But he gave all that up and all his uh, for, for the work of the gospel and for the going forth of that, you know, uh, the telling of the gospel. He was so keen, you see, to do that. And of course, uh, Colin Kill, he really named the Dove of the Church. He studied under St. Finian of uh, Moville, County Down, and Finian of Clonard, and was ordained deacon in 551 AD. Sorry. Uh, Finian of Moville loaned the Psalms to him. He copied it, and this is the great thing. Maybe he was one of the first of doing this copying. And he copied it, and he, he refused to return the copy uh, to, to Finian. That caused a bit of a problem. The high king ruled every cow her calf, and every book her copy. And he thought uh, uh, Colum Kill should give up the copy too as well. Spent it, got it all, uh, quite a big area of that sand. So there was a fierce battle and many casualties. And he held on to that. 
he really uh, was was uh, terribly affected by it all and he vowed that he would uh, bring the gospel to more people and that they would be converted and come to Christ uh, than was killed in the battle. So the kata was what developed out of it, the kata of Colonkill, a sixth century copy of the Psalms from Psalm 30 to 150. So he was very busy, uh, you know, doing that and, uh, and did, did then feel he should, should be his uh, copy. Uh, that's a sample of the, the kata. Uh, the desire to see more saved and killed in the battle, he, he thought. And uh, a great concern he had for this, uh, for the word of God. And, uh, there were great, uh, you know, this is, shows you the art, the Celtic art and how they, they did these things. They were very, very meticulous and uh, mighty men to copy out things, as you see there, if you ever visit the Book of Kells in Trinity College, Dublin. St. Colum Kells Church, their own church at Gatan, where he was born. And uh, uh, there it is. So uh, he founded a monastic settlement, you know, too. Uh, Derry. As the, was one of the, well, the first, Doro, uh, Iona, and Kells then in 550 AD. Right. So the page there, that's the page of the Book of Doro, uh, 700 AD. Right. Uh, and Doro Abbey, the, the church there, we visited that, the church at, uh, at Doro, and um, it would have been a uh, Church of Ireland for some time, uh, but it was, of course, the Abbey there, of course, that they, right? And the big thing was this uh, 10th century high cross. Many biblical scenes on that. It was quite a work of art, uh, again, you know, there. The sin, the church at uh, Duro. Right, oh, thank you. Uh, and that's it there, the, the plaque outside the church, you know. And we'll see it a bit better here now, if I can read this to you. Uh, the first monastery here was founded by St. Columba uh, around 556. And it became Augustinian around 1144. The Book of Doro, one of the earliest Irish decorated manuscripts, was written here around 650. The church is a restoration of a medieval church. The 10th century high cross shows the sacrifice of Isaac, David, and Christ in the glory on the east side. The soldiers guarding the tomb, the arrest of Christ at the, and the crucifixion on the west. Adam and Eve and Cain slaying Abel are visible on the south face and the flight into Egypt. On the north, uh, there is an early, uh, there, <coughs> there is also a fragment of another high cross here, as well as the early Christians' grave slabs. Right, so a lot there for you to take in, you would see there. Then there's, of course, Column Kill's well. Most of these places would have to have a well, wouldn't they? And uh, that's it there. Uh, the well, of course, to see a great plaque. Of it there, but I think it's mainly the same uh, reading as on the uh, at the church. So, on then to Iona, Colum, Columba. Now the Colum took twelve disciples to Iona. Twelve Irishmen he took on that boat to Iona, and uh, uh, that of course isn't the original thing he built. So we don't have all those original. Uh, he founded the important abbey on Iona which became a dominant religious and political institution in the region for centuries. They took the message of the gospel all over Scotland, and in Scotland, they sang psalms. Right. Uh, that's the important thing uh, for them, the psalm book. Admana, Ad Adoman, Adomnan, uh, Ninth Abbot wrote, Columba's life story and recorded his death 597 AD. The abbey suffered attacks from the Danes and Normans. That's what most of these abbeys and, and centers would have suffered. And finally, in 800, hundreds, 
really, Kella, the 19th abbot, fled to Kells. Sadly, that's showing you the downfall then, you see, because most of that were moving, coming across from uh, England, North England, and uh, Iona to there. That was the last. They all fled to, to, to uh, Iona, and then finally to Kells. So, Lindisfarne, Holy Island is the next spot. That is quite a place there, and uh, that, of course, is the, the castle there. Not too much to do, not Christian, you know. But uh, St. Aidan was the man who came there. The first one uh, uh, was uh, a failure. And Aidan said, uh, well, you have to understand them uh, and to bring the gospel message and talk to them, you know, and explain it to them, you know, uh, and think about how you can do that. And so he's the first abbot and bishop of Lindisfarne. He was very uh, popular there, but, you know, uh, <clears throat> that's how they later started that... Uh, um, they had the monastic settlement and then a monastery. And so the great thing was the Lindisfarne Gospels. And here is a, a, a facsimile uh, of the Gospel of Matthew, you know. Lindisfarne, also known as Holy Island, is one of the most important centers of the early English Christianity. The Irish monks settled here in AD 3635. You know, and uh, Bambara Castle was important too, because King Oswell was a, a real Christian. He 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 was at uh, uh, um, he was at uh, um, huh? Not Whitby. No, he was at uh, where uh, uh, Columba came there to uh, Iona, and uh, he there heard the gospel and came to faith in Christ. And uh, he uh, was greatly challenged that the gospel should do it. He wanted Aidan to come there, and he appointed Aidan as the uh, first bishop of Northumberland. And of course, he was also the bishop of uh, Lindisfarne. Uh, St. Coleman, of course, later on, he, he had a meeting with the king. When things weren't, uh, you know, they were going on well, you see, but uh, uh, the Roman church was coming up from Canterbury, and uh, for the Roman uh, Church, Easter Sunday was the Sunday following the Paschal full moon, right? Uh, March, April. There wasn't seen that much importance about that, so biblical, you see. But um, that, of course. And the, the Celtic, the British Celtic Church followed the Jewish Passover, the month uh, 14th Nism. Right. Coleman. Uh, you know, and they wanted, they favoured, you see, this, this, the, 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 um, <coughs> the Roman church as over the Celtic church. And Coleman sadly saw it replacing the simple biblical worship for more ritual and regalia. Right. Now, the tonsil was another, was a secondary issue. Of course, the date of Easter, you know, was a secondary issue too, you know. But the tonsil was a, was a secondary issue. Uh, the tonsil was a this uh, the uh, the Roman tonsil was a bald in the center of the head, and the uh, the the Celtic of course was the front was the more more shaved the front across of the head, so uh, different. But that was that was secondary issues. But uh, they they made some issue about it, you know. Uh, uh, all right. So Will Wilfred, he was the chief advocate for the Roman position. And he was, uh, he later became Bishop of Northumbria and Lindisfarne. You can read more about that in, in history, uh, you know, as you Google it, uh, but uh, that's basically the bit about it. So Coleman and the Ionian supporters who did not change their practices withdrew to Iona. And Coleman was allowed to take some relics of Aden with him. Aidan had been central in establishing Christianity of the Ionian tradition in Northumbria. He was very successful in it all, and uh, was a great, uh, uh, you know, abbot and bishop of the area. <coughs> Columba, by the power of God, ignited a great spiritual fervor, and it enabled Ireland to earn a great title. 
they're the world they're they're uh, uh, and then a kind of a reconstruction of a monastic path there you know and this one of course is Bangor and uh, they called it it earned the name the land of saints and scholars men like Columbanus the mighty man that was prepared at Bangor in the sixth century and uh, he was challenged to take the gospel to Europe and uh, he did travel many miles, you know, all the way to, to Italy. Uh, he was quite a, a champion and he was quite a giant in the work with, uh, of course, he's, he was, it was all, that all interest and fervor was all generated by the power of God and uh, by men like uh, uh, Columbus. So Adman, Adman, he was a 7th century abbot of Iona. Of course, too, was challenged and a great star work, too, as well. The principal study was the scriptures. That was the great thing. They memorized the Psalms and they practiced prayer and fasting. You know. Uh, there is the centers of Irish Christian influence that uh, uh, you know, we have here in Ireland, quite a number there, and then across, not so many in England, uh, but and then in France, quite a number, 300 uh, monks in France, and uh, of course, uh, Columbanus, he came all the way to Babio. So all that great centers of Irish, uh, that was uh, right on near Rome. So it was quite amazing how they, uh, the Celtic church was moving out into Europe. That was the big day of it. Columbanus and his monks traveled to Bobbio in Italy, 613 AD. He had 300 monks in France on the way, uh, in different centers. His words, we Irish living at the edge of the world, followers of St. Peter and Paul, there has never been a heretic or schismatic among us. Now, uh, there were mighty men, you see, and mighty well united, and they were united with the cause of the gospel. Uh, as another couple uh, put a, 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 a thing on them, and on, the, on it was written, united to fight for Jesus. That was their wedding um, motto on their wedding day, united to fight for Jesus. And that's what they did, you see. And Columbanus and others arranged that the entire Psalter be recited over the week. Right. Also in private, the entire Psalter daily. That was a big work. And they were hard workers, you know. They didn't just uh, do that, you know. They were uh, providing for themselves there as well. He did not want to give up the Irish way of calculating of Easter. He felt that was according to the, uh, the Passover time and the, the proper date of Easter would be at the Passover time and the sacrificing of the lamb there, you know, reminder of Jesus and Jesus' resurrection. And so another thing was the ancient book of Psalms was found in an Irish bog. By a construction worker, it was open to Psalm 83. That's Psalm 83 in the Latin version, the, the um, uh, Jerome's of the, the Latin Vulgate. And, uh, uh, that's why it, ours would be Psalm 84. Strength is in you, in whose 
84 verse 5 blessed is the man whose strength is in you whose heart is set on pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Baca they make it a spring the rains also cover it with pools they go from strength to strength each one appears before God in Zion we have already read that and that we have saw that how amazing you know uh, uh, there you see and it is a great blessing, you see, for the man whose his strength is from the Lord, you see, it says, you know. The psalm begins already, and uh, it says, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! You know, my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. And that is the, that was the desire, and that was the concern of those uh, Celtic warriors, uh, you know, gospel warriors. Uh, to bring in the good news to different people and over right over Europe. And so as they passed through, yeah, the Valley of Baca would really mean the Valley of Tears. But you see, even there, they make it a spring, a blessing, you see. And the rains also cover it with pools, you know, which means uh, blessings from that. You know. They go from strength to strength. That's how they went out. And that's how they laid hold on these promises from the Psalms. Each one appears before God in Zion. They knew they were going to stand before God. And they were standing before him in prayer and in the reading of the Psalms and the word of God. That was great, you see, for them, you know. Right. So Kells was founded by St. Colin Kell, 550 AD. That was the St. Colum's house, they call it there. Uh, it's a 10th century three stone there up in the roof you have three stone bed floors you know for three people could lay down there on the on a stone floor uh three sections 
uh, Canada bedroom. You'd have to climb through across from one to the other. If the if the first one was in bed, you know, then you had to climb across to the next one. Uh, it was quite tight, uh, you know, but it was quite interesting. So the Book of Kells has been dated back to somewhere around 800 AD. Many historians believe that it was started off in Iona and later taken to Kells for safekeeping, where it remained for several centuries. It was stolen and pages lost. The gold clasps that it was uh, you know, held in were removed and later uh, the, the book was recovered without them and in, it's now in Trinity College Library. Uh, you can see the original. Uh, I have had a look at that. And so there it is, some of the things of the uh, uh, Kells monastic site there. Uh, they had the tower, and the tower, you know, Ireland was the last stand of the Celtic church, which was now weak spiritually. Had lost that great fervor, and Columbanus, Columba and Columbanus, and others, you know, uh, they were weaker, and uh, they sheltered in these towers from Viking raiders until it closed in the 12th century. That was the end of the uh, Celtic church, of course. Uh, and of course, that is the, uh, the the towers were very good. It was a good shelter place, but uh, finally couldn't because most things we didn't get in there would be stolen and taken away. And eventually, uh, they were lost. You know, the real fervor. It was quite discouraging, quite hard. Most Celtic sites belong then to the Church of Ireland. And uh, in the 12th century, the Augustinians founded a priory of St. Mary's at Duro. And then the big question is, in closing, how did Ireland become Catholic? What happened there then, you see? To change or switch over from it, and it was a very simple switch. There was no great uh, problem, uh, too hard, you know, but uh, interesting how it was all arranged. In 1155, Pope Adrian, um, the fourth issued, he would be the only English Pope, issued the papal bull, it's called, if I can pronounce it, Lorde Bilter. Uh, it commissioned the Norman English King, Henry, the King of England. So Catholicism came all the way from across from England, the second. King Henry the second, to intervene in Ireland and to assist. You see, the Pope would send the bishops and the King Henry came with the sword to make sure that they got in safely. And so to assist in the reform of the governance of the Irish church and the Irish system of governance according to the Roman Latin rite and the ecclesiastical system. And so there it was. He, he uh, got all that in, you see. They, they, <clears throat> simple little stone uh, churches uh, that was left at that time was no use for, for this Western uh, church coming in and uh, uh, with their choirs and uh, different things, you know. So it was a simple takeover. And there the Norman English church speeded the fall of the Celtic church who had lost their favor. These places would not be at all good enough for this uh, Western Roman church, you know. Uh, it was, uh, had to have their, what is it, their chancels and their um, uh, south and north and east and west, you know, and all that sort of thing, you see. And so, the rise and fall of the Celtic Church. We want to thank you for viewing and hope it was beneficial. You know, this is a voluntary free project and thanks to all helpers and I endeavoured, uh, you know, to credit the photography. And so uh, we thank you for uh, viewing and uh, we hope that uh, you will uh, receive some uh, benefit and some help and some understanding of the history of Ireland, especially the rise and fall of the Celtic Church. Thank you.
of the Lord to see. My heart and flesh they are singing for joy to the living God. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts to me. Even the sparrow finds a home where he can settle down, and the swallow she can build a nest where she may lay her young. Within the courts of the Dwelling